Well, hello everyone and welcome to a very special episode of Wildy Garden. Well, it might not be too special for you guys, but for me, this is a pretty proud moment. I am today in Lichfield in Staffordshire in England, where I am about to embark upon my 100th wildlife pond over my career of about 16, 17 years. I have now, or will hopefully within the next couple of days, have built 100 of these amazing habitats for wildlife. And of course, if you're thinking about your own wildlife pond, just get one in your garden. They are the best thing you can put in your garden for attracting wildlife. Now, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through this uh, this one. I thought it'd be special to make a nice video about this pond and uh, just to show you a bit more of the thought process rather than just a time lapse of it. I want to just kind of show you through how I do it. And of course, I have got the three part, full three part series on how to make a wildlife pond on the channel if you haven't seen that already. And of course, I will put a link in at the end of this video. However, I wanted to show you some of the detail of what we go to or the lengths we go to to create these habitats for wildlife and how they are an absolutely incredible resource within literally hours of being installed and already attracting wildlife. So, but I want to show you a bit of the garden first because hats off to the couple that own this garden. As I say, I mean, this is a, a, a lovely sort of Victorian, um, you can't really see it from here, but a Victorian uh, semi-detached house in Litchfield. And it's absolutely beautiful, this garden. I'll put a little picture in now of what the garden used to look like when they first moved in some two or three decades ago and what a transformation i mean you've got this fabulous apple tree here of course the digger wasn't there that's ours that's coming in um there's so much habitat for wildlife in here but the piece de resistance i think is as you get down this part of the garden where well, they have got some lovely features got some lilacs and buddleias and but just look at this i mean these are all evening primroses and i'm told that the garden is of course not looking its best now that i've arrived however i think it looks pretty flipping stunning if you ask me there's just absolutely wildlife everywhere there's there's loads of things buzzing around us at the moment lots of um small whites green vein whites large whites there's holly blues uh, flying about butterflies there's bees everywhere hoverflies everywhere there's lots of poppies that have gone over you can hear the seeds in those um I might, if I can, try and film some of these evening primroses opening up later. As their name might suggest, they completely just open almost in slow motion as uh, the evening approaches. So I'll try and film that for you. We have some of these wonderful verbascums, as you can see, pretty, pretty tall. Um, and these are great mullein, which are an absolutely brilliant plant for the mullein moth, of course, which makes sense given its name. Uh, there was one or two down there, but uh, they've gone off to pupate now, the caterpillars. Um, but they're a great caterpillar and just an absolute wildlife haven. And look at this, butterflies all around the cornfield annual meadow, which is uh, oh, just stunning at the moment. I wish I had a bit of more room at mine for one of these. Um, and then we've got obviously this massive block of hazel, which is fantastic. Coppiceable, of course, uh, creating a really good habitat for birds and Lots of invertebrates and things. We've got holly tree up around there. Fantastic. Must be about 30 foot tall, that thing. Really, really good. Uh, Neighbour's garden, but some lovely birch trees. Uh, one there. Fabulous rowan tree. That's certainly one of the more bigger specimens, or should I say one of the larger specimens, most larger specimens that I've seen in a wildlife garden in recent months and years. And if I go through now, <laughs> through this lovely little arch of Forsythia, which we'll probably have to lift up slightly just to uh, get the digger through. It opens out into this gorgeous woodland glade orchard down the bottom, which is in transition at the moment. They're um, fighting a bit of a bindweed problem, which can be a bit of an issue, but this fantastic mature hedge, as you can see, all down this side of the garden. That's a, a mixture of privet and holly by the looks of it, a bit of hawthorn as well. And again, holly blue down there, just alive this place is. Um, all in all, just a lot of it left to its own devices once it's been installed. We've got a, a plum tree here, which is producing some fruit now, some really lovely old apple trees, which are kind of a few relic specimens of what was no doubt once a traditional orchard. And what I noticed about this garden, hats off to the lady that gardens this garden because She's left me an absolute, shall we say, uh, toy box of uh, dragonfly perches to choose from. There's three or four there. Um, there's 
stacks of old apple. Apple wood is really, really good. Dries very hard and creates these fantastic, sort of lovely twisty gnarled dragonfly perches, which of course, if you haven't seen my recent video on dragonfly, dragonfly perches, what they are, why you should have one in your pond, do check that out. But there's a great selection to choose from there. We'll come on to that later. We've got lots of existing log stacks from some of the old fallen branches from the apple trees and pruning works and things looking fabulous and aged now. Anyway, I'm just gonna swap hands briefly and show you the site for the pond. So we have a marker at the back there. You might be able to just make out a little wooden stake around about there. Uh, it's gonna be four meters by three meters across. So a really nice area, obviously lots of sun. That's the main um, thing you want for a pond. You don't want it too shady. A bit of shade is fine, but lots and lots of sun. Now, let me just get my bearings as to where we are. So south is pretty much that direction. Um, so this spot here is gonna get a great bit of um, morning sun, afternoon sun. And uh, as long as the trees are sort of kept in check a little bit, it'll be a really good spot for the pond. So four meters long by three meters wide. Um, great job this because all the soil is being left on site means no skip, no waste disposal, just fantastic. We'll just have a few off cuts of liner. That will be about the waste product of this pond. So really, really nice green environmental approach to uh, this pond, which is brilliant. So all the soil, there's a slight depression here already. is going to be dug out, probably placed into a new mound somewhere underneath these apple trees, um, yet to be determined. So we can, of course, then reach the subsoils, which, as you know from watching a few of my videos, uh, you'll know that the subsoil is the key element to a wildlife pond, that and the plants, of course, which, again, we'll look at later on. So first things first, I've got to get that digger from the far side of the garden, through the under the apple trees, through the archways, and through all the lovely scenery, get it into here, start levelling the site out, and then we can start marking out the pond. now well underway we've marked out the four by three meter length and width and after a fair bit of digging there was a lot of topsoil we're finally now getting down to these more sort of orangey brown uh, subsoil layers the top layer of the topsoil is very rich because it is part of an old orchard obviously all that leaf litter over the years no doubt mulch grass has just rotten down 
over hundreds of years, <laughs> no doubt, to create a very rich, thick black topsoil, which is absolutely beautiful. You'd absolutely want some of this in your herbaceous borders if you were trying to, to, grow, to grow some herbaceous perennials, but we're down to the poorer subsoil layers now, so it's time to start mining that out before we think about shaping the pond. Okay, so that's the pond well and truly dug. We're nearly at one meter in the bottom, which is almost pure sand. So a really good subsoil for putting back into the pond once it's had its fleece line of fleece put on top. And as you can see, we have a first roll of fleece here to go in. So we're gonna put an under layer in under the butyl liner to protect the liner, of course, and then a layer of fleece back on top to protect the liner again from the, uh, the subsoil, which we're gonna put back in the pond, which if I spin around here, you can see we have a very nice pile of now, which is looking absolutely wonderful. Very, very sandy. And um, so it's gonna to hold together quite well. It's, uh, yeah, you could almost build a house with this stuff. So yeah, quite unique, but um, every subsoil is different. But generally, as long as it's a poor subsoil, as long as you don't have that sort of rich, sort of black uh, fertile topsoil in the pond, because it will give you algal problems, all sorts of fertility issues in the water itself. Um, and the sort of the natural balance of the water will uh, not be too brilliant if you use topsoil for backfilling. So a poor subsoil is key to establishing a wildlife pond in one of these styles, if you like. So uh, yes, time to get it fleece line fleece, and then we can think, in a, think about getting the subsoil back in and some of the nice sandstone boulders. Well, that is the pond fleeced, lined and fleeced. And now it's time for these wonderful sandstone boulders, which I just used to uh, retain the subsoil where it is a bit more, or a bit more of a vertical side on this edge, if you like, on the, the deeper part of the pond, which comes up to a shallower bay here, which is where we'll have the cobbles. And um, the rocks will now go from the bottom, pretty much I'll put a little bit of subsoil in the bottom, then start adding my uh, sort of almost dry stone wall effect of boulders, if you like and this beautiful subsoil, which you've just seen, which will be uh, the basis for uh, the support for the rocks, if you like. So that'll go in the bottom a few inches, then the rocks on top, and I'll start building up from there. So a bit of hard work to do now. It's now about half past five, so what better time to start building a wall?
Okay, so as you can see, the rocks are finally in. The subsoil is in. We've just done the first trim of the liner around the edges. Always leave a little bit too much on your first trim because obviously the weight of the water can pull your liner down somewhat. So never cut your liner too low before your water levels are filled up. So now it's the second best part of the pond process before planting, obviously, and that is the water has gone on. So now obviously we're using tap water here. So uh, it's not ideal. Obviously you would use rainwater in an ideal situation, but of course it's going to take a lot of rainwater to fill this pond up. So uh, tap water is okay. The chlorine will disperse over time. So I'm uh, yeah, looking forward to letting this thing top up before we call it a day at eight o'clock. So yes, hopefully day two will go just as smoothly as today and uh, we can get everything planted and wrapped up. So it's day two here on Wildlife Pond 100 and uh, gorgeous day. It's uh, nicely sort of overcast, not too hot, perfect for working in. And we've had a bit of rain overnight, however, not this much. We left the tap running, of course, last night and the clients have switched it off before they went to bed and on, put it on again this morning. And that has nicely filled up to almost where we want it to now. Uh, we've got a bit more topping up of soil to do around the edges to just lift the liner up so we can get a bit more water in the pond itself and just cover a few more of those cobbles on that beach at the far end, which of course is designed to allow 24 hour a day access to all the sort of creatures that are going to be visiting this pond, hedgehogs, foxes, um, you know, all the reptiles and amphibians as well, hopefully. So fingers crossed that's going to be a nice little space for them to come and obviously bathe and drink from as well. Birds in particular need a little bit of an open space around the margins of the pond, hence why these cobbles go in to create a bit of a beach. Um, and to top it up, we actually use a mixture of tap water, which of course is not ideal uh, with the chlorine content. However, it was really the only option to get this filled up with enough water so that we could plant it today, of course. So a lot of the water came in from the plastic pipe here, which is connected to the water butt, which is connected, collected water from uh, the roof of this greenhouse, which is great. Obviously the, uh, the preferred method of filling up a pond, however, not everyone has access to hundreds of litres of rainwater. So to kickstart this pond, we've obviously filled it up with a tap, but that's fine. So yes, we've got a final trim of the liner to do once we've got a bit more soil and topsoil around the edges. And then hopefully, my imaginary watch will be having a delivery of wildflowers and all the oxygenating plants and marginal plants before 12 o'clock noon, so we can get this thing planted and yeah, finish off this pond that will be hopefully very soon attracting a lot of wildlife. Birds down here already this morning when the clients came down first thing, they lifted off, they'd obviously been drinking from it already. So already without any plants, still attracting wildlife and uh, I can't wait to get this thing finished. So the rain's arrived a bit early. However, we have taken delivery of the plants, which are, yeah, being unpacked as we speak. We will be spacing those out shortly. I have lots of oxygenators and uh, lilies and things around my feet. So I'm gonna start putting those in around the edges in a moment, and then we can start spacing out the rest of the plants. So I always do my planting in two phases, one with the uh, marginal plants, the aquatic plants, that's everything like water soldier, fringe water lily, hard rush, um, the hornwort, of course, which is the oxygenating plant, which is absolutely essential in any pond to keep the water clear. The surface, what I would call the scum at the moment, is just the air bubbles that are coming up from the subsoil. So that's not a problem, that'll clear within a day or two. So yes, we are just finishing the final trims of the liner and then we are ready to get planting.
Well, that is some of the key features in. We've got a dragonfly perch here, a little double one, and another one on the far side, which of course will act as a really nice prominent perch for dragonflies and damselflies to hunt from. Of course, they've almost got 360 degree vision, so they like a prominent perch in which they can look around the pond. If you haven't seen my video um, on dragonfly perches, why you need them and the benefits of them, do check that out in the other video on the channel that I've done recently. And as you can see, we have lots of boxes of plants, which is music to my eyes, shall we say. So I'm gonna start spacing those out now. I've already got the fringed water lilies in and the hornwort and the water soldier. And for a full list of all the wildflowers uh, that you will need in the pond, please check out the three part video, how to make the ultimate wildlife pond on the channel. Uh, just go to the pond section in the playlist and you'll find it on there, no problem at all. And that will list all the definitive species that you are likely to want within the pond, the different varieties of plants, the submersible plants, the marginal plants, the wet loving wildflowers, uh, and the floating leaf plants and all of those. So it explains in more detail. But in this video, I just want to obviously show you the making of this pond and um, exactly how I do it. So uh, we are ready to go. I'm going to start spacing the plants out now and then uh, we can think about seeding around the edges and getting things wrapped up. Well, there you have it. Wildlife pond number 100. Officially complete. I've just got a bit of seeding to put around the edges. Now that the rain's coming, I've got to chuck that down quick, but it's perfect timing. Gives it a bit of water to uh, to bed all the plants in around the margins. And they will, of course, soon and already are attracting insects to some of the flowers, some of the common flea bane already in flower. The sneeze work, purple loose strife as well. So really already looking like a nice, Fantastic habitat for a lot of wildlife. Now, I know what you're thinking, the, the top of this water looks a little bit dirty, which yes, it does. This is just the froth from the subsoil coming out of the water sill, the air bubbles, if you like, coming to the surface and creating a bit of a, a foam on top. But within a couple of days, that'll be clear. The water will be clear. The oxygenators, the hornwort, of course, will start doing their job and making this a really clean and wonderful habitat for so much wildlife. I can't wait to hear from the clients what will be the first insect to turn up. My betting is probably pond skater, but we shall see. I know there's been birds already, as I say earlier this morning, around the pond. Um, and that means that obviously on this kind of um, marker in my wildlife career that I've created 100 wildlife ponds. There have been thousands of plants installed. I'll work out some figures <laughs> at some point. Uh, lots and lots of dragonfly perches and of course many many habitats across the UK. So if you take nothing else out of this video please do just get a pond in your garden. They are the best thing you can do for wildlife and um, they really are such a fantastic habitat if you haven't already heard me say that a million times before. So wildlife ponds do have a go at one, even if you haven't got enough room to put one of these in your garden, this is only four by three meters of course, then do have a go at a little uh, wildlife barrel pond, which of course I've got a video on the channel as well as to how you can make one of these yourself. They are even still such a brilliant habitat for wildlife. So just put water in your garden, it will attract lots of life, I promise you. So. Thank you very much for watching. I promise to bring you many more habitats um, or videos on some of the habitats I create all around the UK. And I promise to continue to do my bit to spread the message of wildlife conservation worldwide. And of course, I get people from all over the world telling me that they've made a little pond in this style with their own native wildflowers, which is absolutely brilliant to hear. So all the way from America across to India, Australia. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate the support and um, keep doing your bit for nature. I'll see you soon.